strap on your metaphorical scuba gear, because today we're plunging headfirst into the ocean of homesteading to reveal why aquaponics isn't just a hobby and discover why it should be the heart of every homestead. Welcome to the world where farming gets fishy and fish farming gets leafy. Today, we're diving, quite literally, into the astonishing universe of aquaponics. I'm here at Olive Branch Aquaponics, where water whispers the stories of symbiosis, sustainability, and success. The tale unfolds not just above ground, with its vast array of plants and creatures, but also beneath the surface of these quietly burbling waters. Meet owner, Bob Ryder. You could say his heart, soul, and perhaps scales and feathers are embedded in this land. His family believes that aquaponics isn't merely a method, it's a conviction, a way of infusing vitality back into their farm. Meet Casey Hoover. And she's going to take us on a journey through their little Eden to unveil the magic of integrated farming and show you what all plants and animals are actually supported by this aquaponics farm. The first stop, the fowl king. Now folks, most farms have your regular characters like the chickens, the turkeys, and here they play a pivotal role not just as egg producers, but as bug controllers and a source of natural fertilizer. These birds aren't just part of their farm, they're a part of their family. I'm here with Casey Hoover and uh, she's about to give us a tour of Olive Branch Aquaponics to see everything here on the farm. And then we're gonna get into uh, why aqua aquaponics is the heart of every homestead. As we step onto the hallowed grazing grounds, the cattle, goats, horses, and even Casey enrich the scene with a pastoral melody. But remember, on an aquaponics farm, every creature plays a unique interconnected role. These animals help them manage the farm in ways machinery never could. They control weeds, their manure is a vital input to their compost, and they also play a pivotal role in maintaining the sulfur aura of their ecosystem. As we approach the pond, the plot thickens. Tilapia, renowned for their resilience and role in aquaponic systems, take the spotlight. So Casey, you've got uh, a nice little pond here. What kind of uh, fish do you guys get off the docket? Yep, we stock this with bass, catfish, and koi. And we've got some koi in here that have been here for, that have not been here, but they're 25 years old. We just put them in there the other day and they're, they're about old. that long. Wow. Yeah, band-tailed koi. They're, they come up and you can see them all the time. Uh, they come up and they'll eat all the algae and stuff. In the in the summer, early spring, we'll release tilapia in your pond. And they'll actually deepen your pond by about six feet. They'll clean up all that extra, all that stuff that's in the bottom. Now, we're going to get into it, but if I'm not mistaken, tilapia is not very well suited for our uh, winters here. Yeah, that so correct? tilapia can't be under 55 degrees. At 55 degrees, they start to themselves with that, so... If you don't, this, which is what's good whenever you're just using them to deepen your pond and clean up your pond because they will um, they'll clean all that up and then they die out in the winter. The reason, and in some states, tilapia are uh, legal because they're so invasive. They breed right. fast. They sink over. So well, unfortunately, <laughs> our, our uh, tilapia friends here probably have a short lifespan once they reach this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go on and see what else we got going. The next act of our tour unfolds in this verdant oasis, where the water enriched by our aquaponic friends brings life and vibrancy to an array of plants and trees. From leafy greens to their orchard with an array of fruit trees, every root here has sipped the nutrient-dense water that has danced through their aquaponic system, bringing forth this lush abundance. We then proceed to the core of the fertilizer production facility, a dedicated greenhouse. This is where the magic happens. Yeah, this particular system right now is under renovation. We're, we're turning it over into a fertilizer production only, not, not 
focused on vegetables, but focused strictly on the waste and the fertilizer. And all of this. And we're in the out. process of updating this right now. Yeah. I'm imagining that you guys have some fish in here. Yes, there's there's lots of fish in there. So uh, which this one's already nutrient dense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're they're going in here. This is going through a filter right now. This is just the uh, gravity flowing right to our beds. So um, we're just getting we're messing with that balance to try to get it up. The plants are kind of separating, but we're fixing them to wipe them out. The only reason those are in here is to take some of the nutrients out so the water will get back to the first plant. We, we don't want no, we don't want no plants taking that nutrient. And so we want all the nutrients going to the water, going to the wastewater. So what we're doing is taking this out and we're going to set our fish tank truck on the side to feed this tank and all the waste will go in here. And then okay. we'll go through the beds and do the fence formations on the ammonia to the nitrates. And at that point, it's going to go through the tank no, that, but that, that, that will be, be the fertilizer. That will be the fertilizer. Right. It's got the nitrate. Right. right. So, if you're saying that you didn't want to take the, you don't want the plants taken away from that. That's right. So, uh, you have fresh how water. do you circulate that? You gotta have fresh through? water coming. You don't. You don't circulate it by tree. You got fresh water coming in constantly. Constantly. And then all your water comes through here is wastewater going into your tank. So for every 300 gallon of water I run through here, 300 gallon of fertilizer into that tank. Okay. You gotta have a constant supply of uh, fresh water to be to do that. So you're you're continually cycling through fresh water, then picks up the nutrients. So that brings me to the next question. You must really have to dial that in. Yeah. You, you do. You know, there's a certain amount of pound of fish, a certain amount of feed you gotta feed them to dial that into and what we try to dial it into is 150 ppms of nitrates, which is going to be the you know, equivalent of 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre the way we're putting it. So, right. so there is a calculation there dialing things in. Okay, so when this is completely set up, according to your numbers, do you have any idea about how much of a day that it is as far as gallons? Yes. About 1,200 gallons per every 36 hours. Well, in this side, in, in this 480 square foot area right here, uh -huh. every 36 hours, 1,200 gallons. Right. So basically, 1,200 gallons of fertilizer every 36 hours. Yeah. So that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. for this yeah. low foot. You keep that going constantly. That adds up pretty quickly. So there must be some data collection points in that system. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you test it before it starts into the system at all? Did it start with water? Or yeah, we, we, we run a test on it daily to see where our ammonia is at and where the nitrate is at, and we'll adjust that by our feed for the fish. I see. And we have a certain area that we want, and then uh, at that point, it's how long it sits in the bacteria full of you know, media here, converting that over into the nitrates. So this is full of bacteria. This is full of bacteria. Right. Yeah. So right now, in aquaponics, what we're doing is this is turning into the nitrates in these plants. We're feeding off the nitrates, in which cleans the water, and then the water will flush back into the fish with clean water. But we're we're taking that process out and pumping it into the tanks, keeping the nitrates in it. So when we put it on the field up here, let's. For a fertilizer. Okay, so you said 1,200 gallons every 36 hours. Right. Does this farm need that? Yes. Yeah. It does need that much. This, this farm, I can use on the whole 20 acres. Yeah, I, I got somewhere to go with it. But that, that's amazing. We've got a bigger system over here set up right now to give you a better idea of process of how the water circulation works on this. Yeah, that's a good way. idea because once we get over there, I want to show the people who don't know yeah. what the cycle is, yeah. you know, how all the steps it goes through and all the equipment yeah. that, all of that stuff and how those things work together. I'm beginning to see a little glimpse of why this is the heart of a homestead. Yeah. Just yeah. a glimpse of it. You're getting a glimpse of it. You'll see yeah. the whole thing over in the other. Yeah. Let's go over there. 
Inside the high-tech testing facility, a world of data collection unfolds. Olive Branch Aquaponics takes its mission seriously, actively gathering data for Langston University to track everything from water quality to plant growth. It's all about fine-tuning and maximizing efficiency. Okay. So right. this is our lab. We have our uh, lab scopes right here where we can take all of our microbes, look at them, and uh, we're doing a test for Langston, obviously, but we do, I freeze-dried some LED the other day, which is uh, like an input, so it's like herds of whey on milk. Um, the whey is really, really good for you and for anything that it touches. And so we freeze-dried it, and we wanted to reanimate it and see if it was alive. Uh, we haven't been able to finish the test yet. But that's what you're working on right now. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other things that you're doing in the lab like that? Uh, so these are these are our test tubes for Langston. We've got a test running out there with four aquaponic beds. Uh, they they're bringing it, the, they're taking like samples from the gravel, they're taking the water sample, they're taking the plant sample, breaking down the DNA and seeing kind of what works best, what kind of beds, like not the gravel, and aquaponics, or even going, so like our people. We're inoculating some of the beds with that, like we do a lot of inoculate, less, less, and so we have the boxlet bed that one's compared to the one with the block. So, that's what they're doing right now. We take those, stick them down in liquid nitrogen, immediately freeze them, and then they go into our medieval little freezer right here. Liquid nitrogen. Yeah, it's right here. Yeah. That would just show them where it is. The stuff will almost immediately freeze anything that touches and burn your skin if it touches you because yeah. it's so cold. I knew this was going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so. so, so we'll take those samples there, the plant samples, the root samples, and we'll put that in there and we'll dip it in there and freeze it instantly. We have a freezer back there that goes to 80 below, like I said earlier. Okay, so the, the question is for people who don't know including me, what, what's the reason you would freeze it instantly and put it in a freezer? What does that Because mean? Langston University comes and picks up. They come oh, so once it's... a month and they pick up all the samples and they take them back to their lab where they can get a little bit more intense with okay, their uh, For storing, storing it in it right in place to where mm -hmm. it was when you collected it yep. and test it. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, so, that back on the freezer back there. Yep. So, is there much that goes on with aquaponics that don't get tested, tested and retested? Yeah. So we these tests that were run with Langston were testing more, a lot more. But when we're we've been running this system for 15 years, like we don't even hardly test our water. Anymore. We don't, right. we don't go in there once a week to test our water. We know what's happening by looking at our plants. We know what's happening by this time. And it's the same or fifth. We came out, the whole thing's working, and you can just tell, okay, something's off. I need to check my pH. Or something, well, I had a fish eye. We check my own again, make sure that it's fine. So you check when you have a reasonable check? Yes. In the beginning, when we install a system, we have our people test every week. And especially when the system starts up, want to make sure that it's all starting and cycling right. Uh, you know, there's a process that has to go through before it becomes off of So, like the, uh, the nitrite, it has to go from that, it has to be converted over. Once it goes through that cycle, then it, the microbes will start creating nitrates. But right in here is our uh, fit. This is where we are up yet. Uh, Catch our eggs. These tanks are right now. We have a breeding pair down here, and then we'll take their eggs and we'll hatch them in this. Uh, this is an egg tumbler. So that will just sit there and aerate and roll the eggs. And as the eggs go, they, they're mouth breeders. So, you know, mouth breeders. So, whenever we see that one of our females is rolling her draw, we take them and we put them in here 
and then sit there and hold the eggs. And once they hatch, we let them out into here. Once the eggs hatch, we put them into here, and then they come over here once they get to a bigger size. Backwards right now. Well, can I tell you a little story? Whenever I was having my little aquaponics experiment, this tank wound up in my bed. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Not in vodka. Once the fish comes in full size, you ever cycle them down. And if you yeah, do, we, what happens? Put them. We put yeah. your them and they, yep. eating them on the farm. Yeah. So Oklahoma laws right now are that you can't sell fish live. I mean, you can sell butchered fish. You can sell a live fish. I can sell you a live fish and then you can take it home and do whatever, do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. It's on you. So you put your you fish. So, Once you take it which, home, it's on you. That's another thing we're doing out here is we're going to those conferences where they are discussing those laws and trying to get them to change them. Thank you very we much. We need them to change those laws because be there is no reason that we shouldn't be able to sell a butchered fish. As long as we're doing it properly, as long as we're doing the clean kitchen, there's a commercial kitchen three miles down the road. We, we can use... Take them there, get it, to the get it done. Yeah, right. but... Yeah. So she just mentioned something that's really, really important, and we'll be covering this from time to time. But that is that uh, that the, the laws and food regulation sometimes inhibits our food supply uh, because of overregulation. I mean, in my opinion, now I'm not I'm not saying that there isn't some need for some regulation, but I am saying that they're they're a little bit too strict. I mean. Yeah. You know, all I'm saying is, you know, we can take care of ourselves, at least those who take responsibility for their own lives. It's some of those laws, I mean, they make it impossible for a farmer to support his family. Right. Yeah, just like, I mean, just like goat's milk, that's another example. You know, 10 years ago, you could not sell goat's milk for period. It was illegal to sell it. Now you could sell it, but they have to come to your farm and get it. Get it. If you take it outside your gate, you're doing something illegal. Right. Unless you go through a process yeah. to where you're basically killing all the good stuff in it. Yeah. My opinion. Exactly. <laughs> My opinion. You're yeah. killing all the good stuff in it through homogenization, and then you've got to be inspected and all of that kind of stuff. I mean. And they make that impossible. We have a friend yeah. that does her goat milk, and she does. She's USDA approved. And so she has to. I mean, it's ridiculous. The regulations that she has to go through. She loses a goat, it's got to be buried. 15 feet away from her neighbor's fence, 15 feet away from any kind of operation that's going on, and it has to be buried six feet in the ground. It's got to be done this way, this way, this way. It's crazy. There's so many regulations. Right. She's just like, it's hard to be buffed with all this. <laughs> so she's kind of gone over to do the good thing. Right. So we're trying to do things the right way. Yep. <laughs> but we just need the right way to be, like, relax the. <laughs> Yeah, relax the regulations. Yep. And now we arrive at the heart of Olive Branch Aquaponics, the aquaponics facility itself. Stepping into the greenhouses, we are greeted by a breathtaking scene. Rows of lush greenery, the gentle trickling of water, and an intricate network of grow beds designed to facilitate the coexistence of plants and fish. It's an ecosystem like no other. The facility here is basically research and development. Uh, people come in here, you know, they're looking for production and all the lettuce and all, but for uh, uh, 15 years now, let's try something, see how it does, take it out, try something different. I've uh, the boost, you know, I've actually put it to the point of disaster. You know, somebody oh, takes it the limit. Fell, pushing the limits and all. Yeah. You know, like, for instance, the uh, the solids, we say we get one, one solid in there, a couple of solids out, you know, why, you know, why what, what, what does it do, how long does it take? So I, I've got my solids in here a long time, and I think it probably be at least 12 months, a couple of months, and then this thing is just going crazy. And know what they're talking about. This is just going crazy. And then you know, what, a few days later, I come in here, and man. This fell off. Right, right now. Fell off, it crashed big time. Fish dead, plants, yellow died. Oh, yeah. so, it, so it's, you know, we're, we're pretty ready. Right, you we learn. The solid, so we learn. You learn. Yeah. Right. But, so we, we, we've taken all the failures in here. 
Well, we know what works and what doesn't work. So when they do something for somebody, we'll put a job in for them. If they don't do this, it won't work. And do this because it doesn't work. You know? So, so we spent the last 15 years of uh, So if you, if you, uh, you know, if you're wanting to do aquaponics, you want to succeed to where Bob here fails intentionally so you can learn from his mistakes. And we're, yeah, and we've, we're to the point now where we're pretty confident in what works, what doesn't work. You're ready to go for production now. Which we're leaning towards the, uh, the turning hang into the fertilizer production because of the need for fertilizer. Yes. But uh, it's also about food. You know, we know how to grow food in here. And, uh, we've done tests over here. We're like sitting on this lettuce and all the nutrients and all that and how fast it grows and what we can do get those so, you know it's all about food but here it's about what works what doesn't work it's not about like this past year i had a tomato plant growing right here and one tomato plant in eight months produced a hundred pounds of tomatoes and there was a heritage you know purple and all so you know come time to take it out which hurts, you know, like, ah, oh, it's still good, good, I don't right. think it out, but you gotta take it out. Did it get pretty big? Oh, yeah, it got a little big. It, it took over this whole area in the region. But, you know, and, but, it, but it produces, and all, but we're, we've got a couple of projects going on now. One in uh, Texas that's 12,000 square foot, and it's it's all about production. And we've got two or three others out right now about production. And, right. and so do they keep in pretty close contact with you? Yeah, yeah, they, uh, we kind of keep an eye out for them too, and the water and stuff. We help to make sure that they're successful and kind uh, of guide them. And if they have any any problem or failure, they bring us in quickly. Right now, but, you you said that this this basically all of this through here is a research facility. Yes, basically. Now you're doing this research for some who is it? I'm doing this research for the people. For the people. For the people. Right. Okay. This ain't about writing a big paper for the universities and the universities do come out and get a research model but this is about the everyday people okay i want to teach you how to be successful at your place for you and your family and it's about growing food and it's growing it's about growing healthy food and uh, we also practice herbs and uh, medicine and all that thing. but i do this for everyone else Right, and that's a good point. You know, I know that you're doing it for an institution that they come out and collect data from you. So, but you're not doing it specifically for them. You know? And the reason is, is because we're doing things that they said you couldn't do, and they can't understand how we're doing it, and they want to know. Right. How know are you making this happen? Doing. Yeah, it's a simple thing, you know. We just kind of across the entrance from home, and it's just something simple with adding more air to the area. Something like that to make it work. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have to, we haven't found anything yet that we can do really, that we, we can make anything work. Mm -hmm. but, but the bottom line is it's about feeding yourself, it's about having a sustainable food. And um, we know what the best thing to grow in here. Uh, you know what you can and do, what you share with can do, uh, you know you need to make money at it and show you the way to make the money at it. But uh, our main goal here is to feed people. And, uh, if there's someone that's something good to eat and find you there. Right, right. Everybody needs to grow some of their own food. You don't have to be an expert overnight, you know, you just gotta get started even if it's small. And then just keep learning, you know, just like obviously you guys. Yeah. You guys really push the limits of learning, yeah. but. Uh, we can take a long time for you. you know, <laughs> we, we don't know it all, we're still learning. There's still a lot of learning. But... Right. Well, one of the things that I think it might be a misnomer out there is that you can only grow lettuce and maybe a few tomatoes yeah. in aquaponics, but that's not true. It's not true. We're going to show you some things that we're doing here right now. But this right here, they say you can't do rep, rep vegetables in the system. Mm -hmm. This this is a little bit different fed than traditional aquaponics. Mm -hmm. The aquaponic water feeds it, and I've got the gravel for the bacteria underneath it, but it does have some soil. This soil that's in here is actually mulch. Uh, Mulch up, granted, and all the pretty you know, It's broke down to some pretty soil here in the city. It's pretty. And uh, microbes and all, microbes put everything. But this is basically all um, root vegetables. So this is really ginger, and we got turmeric, garlic, onions, and we got a 
And now this, now when you, when you do fertilize this and you well, water it, well, what we water it with? How do you do that? We water it with our aquaponic water. So okay. it's going to be our high nitrate water coming in here, just like everything else will do. I see. Yeah. Right back here. It doesn't run constantly like this does. We want an inch, two inches of water in the bottom of the bed. I've got two inches of gravel in here. I want to flood that with my aquaponic water. That's where okay. my nitrates are going to turn around. Then it seeps just See, weeks up to the Yeah. If I put my water on and fill that up to my level, and we got to do this about once a week. All right, so turning it on down at the end, and then I guess he watches it right watch here it right until it, it comes up to about two inches. About two inches. That's kind of how he. That's kind of how he knows. That's about two inches of wheat. The main thing is good. Two inches of water. Now, I don't, I don't touch my water back to my system, because okay, that way, if I get any patent anything here or anything, you know, something in here, I, I don't want to contaminate the system. Right. It doesn't go back. So, so this it is evaporates. It evaporates out. So this is evaporative. Right. Okay. So that's just where we get our root. This one. Right? Everything else, the water comes in and goes back to the fish. But really you know what i took out of a lot of that you know what he just said is that he still incorporates aquaponics even in a raised bed that's that's right here and and he's not that limited on what he can grow in this and that's amazing and i'm just repeating what you said so that people really get it that he'll feed the the uh, nutrient rich water mm -hmm. from the other side up to about two inches and there's gravel in here uh, that creates a wicking bed in the bottom, and so those roots are going to reach down, and they're going to grab hold of that. All right. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, this system here is a, a closed loop system. It's not part of the rest of the system. This thing, these fish feed this bed here. So if I want to do some kind of special pets, I want to add something that might hurt things yeah. instead of damaging the whole greenhouse. I'll do it right here. That way I don't have a massive loss of whatever. And so if I'm anything risky, I do in this bed here for my fish. This is poi. It's 275 gallon of water. I'm feeding uh, 20, 20, 24 foot of uh, the snow bed. So you got three eight foot uh, snow beds. And usually this will be pumped full of tomato or one, one crop. Nothing here. Right now we got some flowers and stuff painted nothing here yeah. in between things. But uh, probably, I don't know, I got a dozen big koi in here. There we go. That's where we get our nutrients right there. They eat that, eat that food, and they pass that, and stuff goes into the water, and through the water into the beds, and then. Yeah, this is a the this is circulation. Yeah. They're on aquaponic system. Should they should they uh, do like you did? Should they isolate this one from the other one so that they don't ever get a total failure? So a redundant good. It'd, it'd be nice. That way you are gonna have a failure sooner or later. You're gonna have to get a problem. Right? I can I can address you, that. You, you're gonna have to expect that. Right? No thank you, you're not gonna have problems with you will. But if you did and had it separated, you know, uh, in different tanks. Mm -hmm. You think you can have it in a hundred percent right? right. Have one a zone that goes down or something like that goes Right. So if somebody wanted to experiment with uh, you know, growing some food and some fish, you know, what would be a, a just a good starter for somebody to experiment with? The pest bed we got over here uh, uh, was four beds, that. that's four closed loops. Uh, I'll show you how that's set up and that will get that perfect. Okay, perfect setup for learning and starting. Okay, and we'll be seeing, we'll be taking yeah, a we're little bit. We're going to make a little yeah. that way. Right. right so, let's, as we go through there, just kind of discuss some of the different varieties that you've even got in this test bed. So this is the, this is the right. fig? Yeah. Okay, this is a fig tree. Yeah. So, you can Flipping. see our little figs right here. It's from a cutting. Uh -huh. um, this plant is only about five years old. So as a cutting, it's right. all the way up. This is our herb bed. We do thyme right here. This time here, this darker kind of older stuff, uh, that's about five years old. That stuff has been going. It went through a whole winter where we lost this whole greenhouse. You can go back and see that video where we lost 
everything is full greenhouse and wiped out and this came back. And a couple other things came back, like the resin came back and a few other little things. But um, this whole bed came back from that winter. Wow. Um, Without having to read. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. So uh, now this one is, is similar to this one. It's not a, in the circulation. It is You're, circulating. Okay. This one yeah. is circulating. Mm -hmm. okay. That's the only one that's not circulating. Okay. Not circulating. This one is because yeah. I've seen that you had uh, this type of rock in it. Mm -hmm. Is this clay or what kind of rock in it? Yeah. Expanded shale and expanded clay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. this is what holds the bacteria to the select sponge. It right. holds a lot more bacteria. All kinds of bacteria, good bacteria inside that. But this is a circulating system. Yeah, what they one thing we've learned in our experiments and all, outside in Mother Nature, we were talking earlier about the fruit trees, I'm not picking the roots. It takes a fruit tree three years of maturity to pick a root. In here, we've experienced any of our fruit trees and our, our big trees. Even our elderberry. Yeah, elderberry and everybody produces a crop the first year. Eight months old in this producer. Did you hear that? This That's amazing. Big tree was just a limb that we propagated. It was this big. It started. And this, this is what it's done okay, in five months. Ago. This is what it's done in five months. And you see all the figs on already, all of the tree. Okay. Propagating with just a stem. Yeah. And then from stem to this, five months in an aquaponics bed. If I didn't see it, there's none that would be hard for the leaves. Right. Here's the proof. Mm -hmm. So the herb bed's got pretty much just all your medicinal herbs and culinary herbs. You got the basil, which is a lemon basil, healthy basil, dwarf basil. You got a lemongrass growing back here in the back. Uh, bee balm kind of coming through. There's sage, sage here. There's lavender. The aroma comes out. It does. Got oregano back here. Oh, the rub some of that under here. <laughs> Eucalyptus. Uh, when we take our eucalyptus from cutting, a lot of people ask us if we take it from seed or from cutting. If you do from cutting, you can take like all the way the seeds. Still a lot less time than you would outside, mm -hmm. but we don't want to make the rest. So the rotation is quicker. Yes. Right. I didn't get yeah. it. Like, I think you can get what? Two different, you get your, your spring and your fall. Mm -hmm. You do better than that? Yeah, you, you, get four, you get four seasons now. Right? You get four seasons here. Yeah. Let's talk getting one right here. This is very high in quality. It's a very medicinal plant for the aging. So this stuff can take over. This one baby's still up here. This one was pulled along now. But uh, that's a very good medicine. And it grows very well. Got a lot of color huh? Go to cola in front of them. Who? Go to cola. Go to cola mm -hmm. is the scientific name. Yes. And that one is one you don't want to look at. Yeah. <laughs> we'll look up that one and look up all the medicinal properties. It's, 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 it's very, <laughs> very helpful. Now, another very helpful thing is this right here. Uh, this is moringa. Mm -hmm. Moringa. Yeah. Yeah. I know all about moringa, but I like to you're five months old, and you're starting to see five months ago. Wow. So uh, this is to my wife out there. This is what aquaponics can do. This is a moringa tree with seeds. Where you can see it right now. Five months? Five yeah. months. You got a leaf on it? You got a leaf on it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We propagate these, so what we do is we, we cut these back in spring, or in the town, and we start, we start in the town. So this would, you can get, go into this as a business, making money, this would be one of the things you can Anthony, I've heard of it, I know for the medicinal, like the nutritional thing that they have been on. And it's very popular right now, and it's high mm -hmm. demand in it. I guess they, they take these leaves and they dry them out. They dry the leaves out, they dry the flower out, they uh, you know, get to do some berries. Uh -huh. we, we do that for berries, we'll make a syrup with it. Uh, it's good for food, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, 
just kind of like the moringa tree, you just everything about it you can you can use. Yeah, moringa is an amazing yeah, you tree. Yeah, you can root from the bark, the leaf, everything you make. Yeah. But this this is another one. This is so this is not native bee bark. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get into this. This, this, is, this is a money maker right here. All the better, all the very to the money maker. Those of you who are looking to make money. Um, a little interesting note about the Filipinos, they take the moringa leaves, they put them in their suits. Yeah. I don't know if we got to do that. That's really good. Yeah. Over in Africa, they'll take that and they'll dry them out and crush them up and put them in the rice. Right. Because that gives it that your minerals and your Okay. Yeah, you got all your carbohydrates and your rice and then your minerals and your and you know you have to be in that's where they get the nutrition. And that's a big deal. Yeah. yeah, let your food be your medicine. Yeah. Just be your medicine. We'll start our plants in the early spring or late late winter. We'll start we'll start planting in here for an outside crop. So you collect your own seeds. You collect your own seeds. How often? Do you start? We'll start in January, December, January, and this gives a head start to outside. And then, like uh, right now, I will I will take some cuttings from my outside stuff, my tomato moss, and I'll bring them here and I'll propagate them in here for my winter stock so coming here. Should have done that a week or two ago, and we'll be behind, but I'm fixing to do that right now. So, not only do we focus inside, we're also sort of focused outside. But when we're done out there like we are now, I'll take pictures off of stuff, propagate them in here, and then by December, I've got another crop in here. I don't have tomatoes in here. So. Now, this is for our outside painting. We're going to germinate painting here, too. I'll bring cutting in from outside, but if we're going to plant for in here, we'll broadcast one of these beds to come full of different seeds, and then we'll after they get up, about that too big in the week, we pull them out and we'll transplant them in the water there. Yes, you can transplant plants in here and hold them in the well. Yeah. Like, like I'm, if I don't like a place in the ones, I can pull it up, move it. Right, because it. they get shot whenever yeah. you do it in the right. right. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to That behind you is the uh, marshmallow plant, and then basil back there behind you, and uh, persimmon seeds. A persimmon is wrong. Yeah, those little guys right there, the yeah. person in here. Uh -huh. Still working over there? Gotcha. <laughs> All the water out there, whole system will come to this point right here underground. Here. And then I will I'll pump it from here and it'll go to a filter. Just to back up a little bit, he said this is the heart of the aquaponics now. In the beginning of this, we said that this that the aquaponics was the heart of the homestead. The heart of the aquaponics was right here. What we what we've learned through this over the years is how it's become the heart of the homestead. And used to we would throw our we filter our water from the waste away, you know, step out in my garden on uh, the roots. We pull all the plant up and off, the drip cut off, and it'd be thrown out. So, what we've learned over the years is that's usable. Uh, they're thrown away, they dry it out, and yeah. we'll so we use the food, dry that out, and we make a pellet with our waste you now. Dehydrate it, and then let it be a pellet out of we create a chicken and a goat meal. And we said, well, for this one, we produce some other products that are our byproducts. Yeah. Back to sustainable, you've got to go with your own food and everything. So everything you do here feeds itself in one thing to everything. So when we grow the worms and the brain gets in here, that's the food that's been there and all. And then our fish, uh, you know, we get a lot of, once you get this here, our fish can thrive off there. So I can take care of this with a pellet, or I can feast him up here. And so I'll put this in my own and I'm not having to do that. Now, right now, I'm not, I'm doing a bunch of this right now. Yeah. But, they can shut down. Okay, make it. So we have been making these pellets, it's good. Duckweed is the highest protein and mineral out there. We can live off of it. That's all we have to use. So, what, what we do 
You walk back back up into the uh, back up into the bed right there. Over here. Yeah. Go back over here to the club. Yeah. All right. Go over here, Pat. Yeah. We plug this bed back in. And we run our duckweed in it. Okay. Now, every time you take duckweed out within 24 hours, it doubles again. It comes right back. So we'll we'll flood this and then we'll we'll drain it and let it dry out. You know, I scrape it up. We dry it out. Mm-hmm. Like this right here. Right. And then just let them from that I'll, I'll take that and I'll put it in with the mango beets that we raise outside. Mm -hmm. We use a fertilizer to spread them in here, and I'll draw them out. If we go get a handful of mangoes. Okay. So, uh, just to repeat what he just said, they'll they'll fill this bed up, and they will raise their duck wheat in here, and then once it dries out, it comes up with this right here. And this is yeah, we raise beets beet. outside, and then we'll spread them. And we spread our beets, and we mix it with our duck wheat. And this is all mixed up together. Then we run it through a pelletizer and it creates a pellet. So now we're getting our we're getting our fiber and our sugars and all from the beets. Mm -hmm. And we're getting our minerals and protein and all from our duck food. And we're producing a nice food for our goats and our chickens and pigs. Mm -hmm. and wow. That's all that was all byproduct at one time. You used to throw away and get rid of it. Right. Don't throw it away. Well, our, our motto here now is when the trash man comes to pick up the trash, like we can reuse everything. <laughs> Everything's got a purpose and feeding something else. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so yeah, see, in the, the beginning, we started out eating lettuce and fish. That's it. Well, now we learn how to eat tomatoes and, you know, right. turmeric and, and make medicine out of it. And we learn how to make food for our animals out of it and all. So it has, we, we woke up one day and realized, hey, this is the heart of the homestead. It, right. Everything benefits from the awful farm. Right. And that's the first time I ever heard that, by the way. So you guys coined that term. AC, you're the first one yeah. that I ever said to it. I said, man, that's, all, that's what this is all about. It's the yeah. heart of the homestead. Yeah. Now you're, so you've got your complete cycle inside and out. Yep. Uh, it, the, where are you taking me next? Just look at the fish. Yeah. We've got pet fish, we've got the crank, the uh, watch, tilapia, and the koi. That's, that's what we've, we've done here. This is our catfish thing. But catfish, as they grow, they need space. And they stress out. So you end up with an issue with problem with your pet. Right? So they're, they don't grow out fast enough, but as they grow, you've got to separate them out. And, they're not big enough to eat. So really, they're not a good fit for a long okay. time. So earlier, we were having that conversation, and I was assuming, and maybe some of you guys out there like that too, I lost my batch of co okay. for some reason. I don't even know why. They got sick, they all died. I tried to save them with everything I knew how to do. So I thought, well, you know, maybe they're just not hardy in this area. So maybe I'm just gonna go uh, to the catfish, because I know that they can survive for just about anything. Um, and they're, they're uh, from this area. And so that's what Bob is telling me, is that that's not necessarily a good idea. Tilapia is the hardiest thing. The only thing is, the tilapia is at 57 degrees, they will die. We can sense it. So you run a heating system? Yes. Okay. Yes, our, our water is heated. That's the mechanism over here on the down there. The, the toy heater right here, the pump. Oh, right here? No. Right here. Right. This pump is feeding this here, and this here is like just temperature. Uh -huh. And wintertime, I'll keep it 40 degrees in my greenhouse, and I keep my water at 70. In the wintertime with tilapia, that's a must. Now, if you're just doing four, you wouldn't have to do that, but the total temperature, they don't heat it well, you're going to do some nutrients and things like growth. So, as long as you're heating that water, then it goes. 70 degrees in sweet spot. Sweet spot. Okay. Yeah. So, that area grows good at that temperature? Yeah. 
So this whole thing is a cycle. Where would you say that the cycle would be? In my mind, the cycle begins with the fish. With the fish, yeah. So what we use here is the lock wheel. Foy, Foy don't have stomach, so they put a lot of their waste down. They pull nutrients, they actually do a better job. But we don't eat the boy, and this is about to raise the food. So we choose to lock it. So here's my main thing. We're running about, we're running about 80 two to three pounds to lock in this tank. 80 two to three pounds? Yeah, they a couple of pounds in what they are. Uh, this, is the main, this is the main supplier right here on this ocean. I think I'm gonna get some small ones here that we raise because we put consistent and then we'll use and replace our guys here. Well, uh, in the lab, I think you see the little fish right there, and that big red rig, they're gonna look good now for here. Thank you, thank you. They all end up at this tank right here, and this is where most of our nutrients is coming from. So, most of your nutrients are coming from here, but then you, you cycle these, yeah. meaning to say, once they, once you get another batch, it's ready. So, maybe, go to work tank, tank, tank. Okay, tank. To tank. Okay. Tank to table. Tank to table. Tank to table. That's a new one. <laughs> this tank, now all these things are tied together, so I'm benefiting from all the waste from these tanks. Yeah. That's my main tank. Mm -hmm. That's 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 we made But now these have fish in them. This has got uh, hybrid perch. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of people want to know, can you uh, raise perch in there for you? You can raise anything. That tank at one time was a uh, shrimp tank. That's shrimp. Okay. And okay. You know, they're they're tough, but that's what that one was. And then this has got perch in it, and perch do well. It's just they don't grow as fast as tilapia. If you can produce food, tilapia, I can grow tilapia. Well, I can grow big enough to eat in two, three months from, from the little ones that are right. eating. Which these guys take six, eight months to get. And then another thing we do, and you got this water lettuce on here, which our animals eat. We may help to filter the water uh, from the fish and all, and then throw up the water with it, and all. And it's, it's another sustainable food. That tank over there got clams in it. We got, we got clams in it. Right now, I collect all rainwater. That's why everything's operating on. Yeah. Because it's neutral. It's mean, it's, it's your system. Okay, when, it, when I run out of water, I have a drought and we can't get that, we can't use that. We're gonna to have to get water somewhere. Because the first idea would be from a pump. Well, from all the spray and runoff from around, it's pond that's the You know, let's go to heavy metal. Right. And what we'll do is we'll pump that pond water into that bed. Clams do such a good job of absorbing oh. nutrients in, in heavy metals and all. Yeah. You, I can't put them fans between my wastewater and through my beds because they pull it all out. They do such a good job. I'd have clean water under my beds and I'd have no food from my beds. So what we do is we use it to filter a little bit of pond water through where it fills a lot of heavy metal down and then we got fresh water coming around. So that's an experiment we're doing as a filter. So if it comes down to it, I'm gonna filter contaminated water. And it will go into that tank, filter down to one of these holding tanks. Okay, so where are you, what? Okay, are you cycling that water at all? Yes, that right. water right now is cycling through my, my system right now. Okay. If, if it comes down to it and I need it in my pond water, yeah. that will be disconnected from the system. system. It will be from the closed loop into another closed loop of pond water into the holding tank. Yeah. yeah that so makes it's just sitting there for emergencies. Right. Example. Things that you learn. I had no idea and I've never seen it ever. Before. I mean, get that beer. if things go down, we get in a drought, and we're like, man, what am I going to do? I've got a way out right there. Right. I mean, I've got a way to produce. Right. I mean, it's working. Sure it's failed. Bad, 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 bad. Right. All this stuff produces the solid waste in the middle. you got to do something with it. You don't want that in your bed. It's, it's bad. It fogs things up, it puts too much nutrients in there, and burns things up, makes some fertilizer pop. So we got to do something with it. Yeah. So we have to back washing, just like the little swimming pool right now, going to. So that goes into the filter. So all this water is coming to one point over here. We're running through this filter. And this filter is tied into that 
tank down here. So we want all the solids out. And once all that solid is out and is in that tank over we've got a high nutrient water that we will use. That's too strong. It's too strong. So what we do is go back and let's over there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. I see down there at that end. Pat, if you could look back down there for just a minute, follow those lines to that thing. See the disturbance of that tank over there. This is where he's back watching the solids back into that tank. Can you kind of explain, you know, how that filter operates? Yeah, this, uh, this body is full of these Bio balls. Bio balls, right. So all these, fins, all these fins on there has got bacteria on it. Bio balls. So that that catches all of the waste coming in here. Right. All. When I backwash, it flushes back out and it flushes all the solid waste back down. But the bacteria is living on it. So as, so as our fish urine goes through this tank, it's already starting to transform into nitrates. So it's, it's turning into nitrates at this point in here. It had to go down to my bed and catch the uh, gravel and all, it turned into nitrate. So this is actually starting the process of converting ammonia over to the nitrate. Yeah. And it's collecting all the solids. So once the solids get so heavy in there, our pressure come up over here, our water pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, water pressure comes up, you know that it's full, and we need to backwash. And then we'll, we'll backwash all the solids out until the pressure comes back down to the right. So this is just filtering out, separating the urine from Okay, so you're watching this, you're watching this uh, pressure here. And I, I assume, now what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing a section here that's green, I'm seeing another section that's red. As long as it's in the green, you're probably okay. Fine. You're fine. Once you get up to the other, it's getting soft. It's getting, yeah, you don't want to get it up that far to deal with the problem. If you do, you can blow, uh, down that before, you can blow these cells off. Blow your cells off. Don't blow your cells off. I don't do it. <laughs> and uh, so, so this is already with this in there. This is this is already transitional or ammonia through nitrates. Okay. This is the middle. Okay, ammonia comes from the plant. To, from the plant to the plant instead of the nitrates. The plant. Right. So that process in the is going from ammonia, nitrates to nitrates. That's right. This and is where the nitrates. This is when nitrates are starting. Starting right here. Right here. Okay, so, so stage number two, number one, the ammonia, your fish coming in here. Number two, you start your nitrate, you're transitioning, and then through the beds, we'll do the bacteria in the beds with nitrates. So nice that you would be able to just backwash this back into that tank. I'll catch it. Because you now, it. And now, instead of being waste, right. we've got a fertilizer that we're going to put our inputs into. Is like the one input she's making is calcium. Right. And the other one we're, we're making is potassium. And how we come up with potassium input is made right here on the farm too because cantaloupe. Cantaloupe is 47% potassium. So we take that cantaloupe and we ferment. That's what we do. We ferment and come up with a oil bill. Yeah. Okay, and once you come up with that, you, know, you get that one to a thousand dilution you got to do, and then you add that to them. So, if I want 10, 20, 10, I'm going to take 10 of that and I'm going to double up on my other input and then my phosphorus is going to be 10. And that's how I'm going to talk about my restaurant. Better get around this edge. We're going down here to that fertilizer again right quick. What we're going to do here is we're going to take that fertilizer and we're going to put it down here. Get this thing going to be one. We get that. The fertilizer we want. We'll put it in that 8,500 gallon tank that's fine. That's the one we looked at. We're going to fill that thing up and then back up with the coat and all this other one. With our minds filled with the wonders of aquaponics waste turned into fertilizer, Bob has a surprise in store. He leads us to a smaller scale setup, a glimpse into how anyone can kickstart their own aquaponics journey. Here, in this scaled down version, Bob demonstrates the essence of aquaponics condensed into an accessible setup. From the fish tanks to the compact grow beds, it's like a miniaturized replica of the larger farm. Bob breaks it down for us, making it seem manageable for anyone intrigued by this farming method. 
He highlights how simple adjustments can adapt this system to various spaces and preferences. The aim is inclusivity, to show that regardless of space constraints or prior expertise, anyone with a pinch of curiosity and a small spot can embark on an aquaponics adventure. You asked me earlier what would be a good right. system to start up with, to practice and learn all. This right here would be a perfect setup for it. Okay, now you're talking about one tank for four beds. No, one tank for one bed right now. Oh, one for one. Yeah. Okay. But now Each this one tank, uses one. This tank big enough that you can run it. Couple beds off of it. We just from the parents, we just got one bed on. So this is one closed loop right here. So we got the fish, we got our water, we got our filter, just like we looked at in there. Yes, our filter goes to our bed and comes through and back. This is our water coming back in clean. So this system set up right properly, you can literally drink that water up there. That thing, you oh, wow. I don't know if I'm that good, so I'm not going to drink it. <laughs> I mean, we did eat the charcoal. Yeah, yeah. And I would have drank it right after that. Yeah, I knew you drank after that. <laughs> so this is a perfect starter to go with something this size and that size for your own experimentation to learn the science behind it. But once you learn this little system, yes, you, you expand whatever size expand you want. By the time you got that done, you would know if you was entering on. Hey, I want to do this, but, but you just double the size of the right. But this would be a perfect setup for a beginner. Right. And, and as far as the filtration system, I mean, there's all kinds of doing lots, yourself like filtration systems. Out lots there. of filtration. What do you got to say about that? Well, it, this is easier to control and yeah. easier to keep up with. Okay. And the like, the other filtration system left is not mechanical. It takes a lot of upkeep. You have to you have to stay on it and a lot of work to where well, this right here pretty much maintains itself and you just deal with it and have to Okay. I like it. I like the. I would suggest you go with a mechanical filter like this. Okay. Now some mechanical filters out there are just ridiculous on way they work and price and all. It doesn't take. It doesn't take a whole lot. Just to kind of have a little perspective on it. A person couldn't survive off of this from here as a family. A family of two could eat a lot of it. You could, you could you, you supplement a lot on, of your... Yeah, because, you, right. now, remember, I've done, I've done one tomato plant. It produced, you know, 100 pounds of tomatoes. You put that in the corner over there, and now you got your tomato plant. Yeah. Put your cucumbers over here, and you got one plant, and give you all the cucumbers, you know. Yeah. Like, you a little bit of lettuce in here. Right. And then, so, you can put enough in here to make you a salad every single day. So, remember, you said, have been 1,700 elderberry starts in one of these beds. That's crazy. Yeah. So there, you can do a whole lot more with that one bed right there than what you can. This is a four in. by eight. That's a four by eight. It's 32 square feet. Right. right. 32 square feet of growth. And every square foot will give you a plant. So you can plant 32 different varieties of something there if you want to be. Okay. Now, if you had a tank this size, this particular, this is a 210 gallon tank. Mm -hmm. How many of those four by eight beds okay. supply? You know, I do not want to take any more than half of my volume out at a time. So half of my volume is, is uh, 100, 100 gallon. Okay, it'd take 50 gallon to fill that bed up. So if I had two beds, I'd fill them up at the same time. It's 100 gallon. So I wouldn't want any more than two beds on it. Okay. But if you were good and got good at it, you could alternate these things up and down. Mm -hmm. You could put three beds on it. Right. You got to make sure your siphon stayed broke up where one bed's filling up, one's emptying, and the other's being the same. I see. So, but it would be much easier on just you put two beds. if you had put two beds, how many gallons again? 210 gallons. 210. Each right. bed takes 50 gallons to fill it up with rocket. Okay. So if you had both beds coming full at the same time, you got 100 gallons and a plus at the same time, it, it brings your water level back up. But you don't want to take any more than 50% of your water level away from the fish. Gotcha. And so two of these would be right at 100, and this is uh, two, uh, 210. Yeah. So it's roughly and it, just and a less. Two beds would give you 64 square feet uh, growing uh, there. Growing area. Yeah. And to start with, this is this is a good place to start well, and grow into another one. Five to six beds, we say what it takes to sustain a family of four comfortably. Five or six beds. Yes. So you're you're talking about at least two of these to sustain a family of four. 
um, and possibly if you wanted to make it real comfortable, you'd get an extra one of these. Yeah, we'll get a 400 gallon tank. Or get a 400 gallon tank. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you there you go. We've got the volume, what you do? Yeah, which makes a lot Basically, of Basically, that's just something that we you know in the front. What I like yeah. about, and what I like about uh, doing the smaller ones, yeah, we think you can separate them out like we saw about a little goes and get different zones where you got different zones and you, much and you have a little bit of redundancy there, I think. Even though you may be on the same closed loop, would it would it help you any at all to have the smaller ones? Like if no, probably not, because if you're circulating water and something happens, you get a parasite, for yeah, example, yeah. here, it's gonna go through there. It's gonna get through everything. Yeah. If it's all in one loop. But now if you don't have it all in one loop, you got separate Pop, so we're talking about this. Uh, you can do tech fishing now if you want to try that and then perch them out and walk in and over and give you a variety of find something different. For a family, you know, if you really wanted to do a little bit of a fail safe, you know, two tanks, four beds, and each one on a closed loop. This one's closed, this one's closed. Yeah, if they're not on a closed loop and they're all in one together, you have a failure. You're going to have a failure, yeah, it's a failure across everything. Right. So, you know. This is one aerator on here, isn't there? Yeah. There's like one aerator all doing air. all these tanks. All the air things in one machine. Oh, all the air is. As our time at the farm draws to a close, Bob Ryder, Patrick Carhart, and I find ourselves gathered outdoors by a crackling fireplace, preparing to bid farewell. So I just want to take a uh, few minutes to uh, Thank the folks here, uh, Bob Ryder, uh, Mr. Uh, Patrick Carhart, and Casey, what was your last Hoover. name? Huh? Hoover. I should have known that. Uh, that's, that was the easy one to remember. Uh, but anyway, I just want to thank all of them for uh, taking the time uh, to show me around the farm today and, you know, to teach me a lot. I just, I, I feel like my brain has been completely expanded almost to the point of explosion. <laughs> However, uh, I'm very thankful for the knowledge that they shared. And Bob, if you could just take a minute to tell me uh, how they can contact you. We, we do most things off of Facebook. This is Olive Branch Osteoponics. And our website is olivebranchosteoponics.com. He picked absolutely the worst person to tell you how to connect. Well, you're standing over there. <laughs> but uh, you, you get us there, but we, we operate a lot off of uh, YouTube. YouTube. Right. Our YouTube channel and all that. But, uh, and Instagram. You okay. follow us on there, right. and we'll, we try to share everything on there. So right. try to make it to where you follow us daily. Right. You know, but you can go in there and look us up. And you welcome, anyone's welcome to come out. Come <coughs> see you know, so we've covered an awful lot of an awful lot of topics here today, um, but if you're interested in knowing any information about aquaponics, about fertilizer, about the elderberry tree, and some of the other things that's amazing that's here, um, uh, feel free to reach out. Homesteading, if you uh, if you want to reach out to any of you know to Bob or uh, anyone here at uh, I'll branch aquaponics, you know, feel free to contact them. I'm sure they'll be able to uh, and happy to uh, answer your question. Yeah. Okay, guys, we're going to do something that we do at the end of every show. And and we're going to practice one time, okay? And then we're going to do it, okay? At the end of every show, we sign off with prepare for the unexpected and keep it local, Okay. And I need you guys to say that with me. Okay. All right. And we're going to practice it one time. You ready? Send it in. Ready? Prepare, Prepare for the, the unexpected, unexpected and keep, keep it, it local. local. Okay. You're going to slow it down, guys. It's, and keep, keep it local. local. Okay. Yeah. Are we ready to try this? Yeah. All right. Till next time, this is Keep with the Farm to Table Direct Show. And as we always say at the end of every show, Prepare, Prepare for the, the unexpected, unexpected and, and keep, keep it local. local.